Grace to you and peace from God who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen. So I'm going to need you all to bear with me today because we're going to do some theology. Because I read an article this last week that was talking about the TOE, the theory of everything. Do you have a TOE, a personally a personal understanding of everything. A TOE it seems to me like it's supposed to help give us meaning, give us an understanding about how the world, the universe, and, and life itself all work together. Several years ago, Stephen Hawking wrote a book by that title. Uh, Hawking, you might remember, he is a famous uh, theoretical physicist. He suffered from amyotropic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, or as we know it better, Lou Gehrig's disease. Hawking had a brilliant mind to begin with, but as the disease ate away at the, his brain and, and his spinal cord where that do muscle control, he was left with little else to do other than simply think. Now, the theory of everything was not something that Hawking came up with on his own. That was actually attributed to a different English physicist, a fellow named John Ellis. Ellis first published his theory uh, in an article in Nature magazine all the way back in 1986. And according to Ellis, the theory of everything is a putative theory of theoretical physics that fully explains and links together all known physical phenomena. Over time, the term stuck in popularizations of quantum physics to describe a theory that would unify or explain through a single model the theories of all fundamental inter interactions of nature. I read that explanation and I went, huh? Because, you know, I, I, am, I personally am far more interested in science fiction than I am in hard science. I'd rather read Terry Pratchett or Douglas Adams over Stephen Hawking or or Carl Sagan, so it is very valid if you're thinking right now, well then why am I talking about this? So our first reading from the book of Revelation is, I think, one of the most misunderstood books in all of the New Testament. The author identifies himself as John. We don't know which John because he never gives us more details about himself. There are actually five books in the New Testament that bear the name of John. We do know that he was on the island of Patmos, which is in the Aegean Sea just off the coast of modern-day Turkey. He was probably there exiled by the Roman government. But while he's there, John has a vision, or as it's generally referred to in English, a revelation. The original Greek word is apocalypsis, which means literally the end of the world. And I know a bunch of us are now singing, it's the end of the world and we know it, but stop doing that because that's not what I'm doing. So anyway, John has this single long vision at a time when the church is struggling to exist. When Christianity begins with Jesus' ascension, the Roman government at first kind of simply ignores the followers of Jesus. Starting though about mid-first century, Nero is emperor and he begins the persecution of the followers of Jesus in earnest. He turns it up to the proverbial 11. Up until that time, the early church, from a secular point of view, had just been kind of flying under the governmental radar, and I'm really oversimplifying things here, but Nero needed a scapegoat, and he found one in this illegal sect of Jesus. So by the time that John is writing, several decades after Nero, uh, which is near the end of the first century, a guy named Domitian is emperor. And if Nero had dialed persecution to 11, Domitian takes it up to about a 15. And from a Christian point of view, under Domitian, it really became the end of days, a true apocalypse. So with all of the politics and the violence going on, John wants to send a message of hope to the first century believers as they face persecution and prosecution. And he wants to help establish just who and what Jesus is. A theory of everything. Did you catch how John repeatedly referred to Jesus in our reading this morning? Him who is, who was, and who is to come. 
John also called him a few other things as well, uh, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, and finally, the alpha and the omega. What John's doing is laying the groundwork for how we today would understand that Jesus is not only God and therefore part of the Trinity, even more, Christ Jesus is who and what ties everything together throughout all of time, all of history, and all of life. John's striving to show that Christ is indeed the theory of everything. But let's look at the phrase that John uses. Let's start with the first part, Christ who is. We, as believers, we say that Christ exists, that he is real. If we didn't, we'd be worshiping something or or someone who is dead, who's no longer with us, that's non-existent, and yet we talk about Jesus in the present tense. We say that even though we would probably all agree that he doesn't exist in any form that we necessarily comprehend, and we say that, Um, when we look at our gospel reading that I read just a moment ago, Jesus simply shows up in this locked room where the disciples are gathered. He didn't knock. The text very explicitly says the rooms were locked. But suddenly, Jesus is standing there right in the middle midst of them. And so, unless he had borrowed a transporter from the television show Star Trek, he apparently has some kind of different molecular structure than all of us sitting here right now. A week later, Jesus does exactly the same trick. He shows up in the middle of the room, but that time he invites Thomas. He says, put your finger here in my hands. Reach your hand into my side. So Jesus can move through solid walls, yet he himself can apparently be solid enough to be touched, to be felt. And how does Thomas respond? Or, or, or why does he want Jesus? Or why does Jesus want Thomas to do this? Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas responds, "Lord, I believe." In other words, Jesus appears to be saying to Thomas and to all of those gathered there, "I am different, but it's still really me." Christ is today. Christ is current. Christ who is. So Christ who was. Now, as believers, we say that Jesus really was. He was born in the backwaters of the Roman Empire. He lived and worked and taught in the Palestinian area, or Palestine area. He, he died while well, he was executed, actually, um, by the Roman authorities. There are even non-biblical records from first century historians like Josephus and Pliny and Tacitus that corroborate that. Um, Even more so, though, do you remember the opening verses of the Gospel of John? We didn't read that today, but John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being with him, in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In John's gospel, the word, or as it is in Greek, logos, is code for Christ. And we learn that in verse 14 of chapter 1. The word became flesh and lived among us. You want even more? Let's go back all the way to the, to the very beginning, to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Jesus is, Jesus was. He was there at the beginning of all creation. He was there with, before creation. The Christ who is, Christ who was. Christ who is to come. And this is what Jesus promises his disciples uh, as they're chatting away there during the Last Supper. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Again, that's John chapter 14. We heard a similar promise in our reading from Revelation today. Behold, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him. 
In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says to the disciples, the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. There will be some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus promises that he will return, and Jesus always keeps his promises. Christ who is, Christ who was, Christ who will come again. And yes, I realize that what I've just talked is not quite exactly the same as Ellis' theory of everything. And that theory certainly has its own flaws. Stephen Hawking pointed some of those out in his book. But, but rather than calling what I have talked about the theory of everything, I, I, the more I thought about it, I actually kind of prefer the way that the Lakota Sioux people put, it, put the basic concept of the theory. And, and they came up with this centuries before the Western world ever thought of it. The Lakota Sioux people from the, from the plains of the upper Midwest have long said, we are all connected. And really, isn't that what the theory of everything, the T-O-E, is all about? The theory fully explains and links together all known physical phenomena. We are all connected. Therefore, what happens to my neighbor affects me as well. If my neighbor is hurt, I will suffer. If my neighbor is helped or has a good day, I'm going to benefit to some degree as well. Because we are all connected. We are all linked together, the way that Ellis put it. But we say we are linked together through Christ. Because Christ is, was, and is to come. When we comprehend that we are all united by this theory of everything, when we understand that we are indeed all of us connected by the ever-present, past, and future of Christ, when we can finally get it through our own thick, sin-filled heads that what I do to myself and how I treat you And what you do to yourself and how you treat others, all of it affects me and it affects you. We affect and impact everyone. When we take our own actions into account for other people's well-being, when we seek to change what we do to benefit everyone, all of us, When we begin to live the gospel and the promises of our baptism, that's the time that we will all truly begin to live like Jesus. Amen.